Okay, are we recording? Yeah, it looks like we're live. Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to, where are we? Toastmaster Speechcraft. I'm Ray Stonehouse, and I'm going to be, I'm the president of Kelowna Flying Solo Toastmasters. We're hosting this particular Speechcraft program, and I brought a couple of my fellow Toastmaster members with me for this particular session to help things out. Just to put things in perspective of who I am and why I'm doing this, I've been a Toastmaster for going on almost 22 years. And the reason I got into Toastmasters originally was because I was absolutely terrified of public speaking. And I didn't want to be terrified anymore. I didn't want to avoid it, so I decided to do something about it. So I joined Toastmasters because apparently that's where you go to learn public speaking. <laughs> it didn't come naturally to me. It didn't come, didn't come quickly. I think I probably went about a good 10 months before I gave a speech. I did everything else before because I wanted to avoid it because I was still terrified of it. Since then, I've probably given thousands of speeches. Now people pay me to not speak. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that happens. The Speechcraft program, I'm going to be talking about it and explaining a little bit, but uh, probably the best way to get started is for everybody to get to, to know each other. You guys know each other. We know each other. We've introduced each other. But the Speechcraft program, we want to try and give you as many speaking opportunities as possible. So one of them is introducing yourself to the group. It's a common practice. If you're at a business meeting, you're at a social meeting, you introduce yourself. Some of the, I wouldn't say it's a rule, but one of the methods of helping you become more confident in this public speaking is getting out of your comfort zone. So we're going to go around the table. I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves. You're going to stand up first. That's the first thing. You've got to break away from the comfort of that chair. So you're going to stand up. You're going to tell us who you are, a little bit about yourself, why you're here, what's important to you in life, what you do in life, why you decided to come out to this particular program. And Teresa looks like she wants to start. I like picking on Teresa. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairperson and our guest tonight. My name is Teresa Keeler. I've been a member of Flying Solo Toastmasters for five years now, and I joined for very much the same reason, just to get comfortable speaking in larger groups. I'm usually okay with smaller groups, but I'm a little bit terrified when the room starts to grow over 30 or 40 people. And Tonight, I'm joining Ray because also what interests me is, is to facilitate. So I thought this would be a good way to practice that. Good to meet you all. <coughs> and one thing we do in Toastmasters that drives people crazy, yet it's a powerful thing, is every time somebody stands up and speaks, we applaud them. <laughs> and we do that because recognition has been proven as a, as a strong motivator to bring people forward and help develop their skills. So you're going to hear lots of clapping in this. If I could, it's not because I'm a sailor and I like to act like well, the flippers and that. <laughs> I'll just keep on going this way. Who are you? Why are you here? Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah. I um, have been with CNIB for two years. Um, I'm terrified of public speaking. I had to do quite a bit of it. Um, through my university career, um, so that's helped a little bit, but uh, I think this will be a great opportunity to um, get out of my comfort zone and uh, become confident. I'm really excited about this opportunity, and I look forward to learning lots. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> First step of a journey. So, yeah, think positive. Okay, who's next? Okay, I'm next. Hi, I'm Lisa. I am with the CNIB. I volunteer, and I wanted to do this because I'm really shy and don't like speaking in public, and this is, hopefully, will help me uh, become a little more better at speaking. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> I think we'll hear more from you later on. And who are you? Why are you here? Hello, I'm Carrie. I work here. <laughs> I work they part time at CNIB. I coordinate volunteer programs. And so Lisa and Sarah and Casey are volunteers. In addition, Casey is my son. 
And um, so I guess he's kind of a voluntold. <laughs> um, I actually love public speaking. <laughs> I always get a little embarrassed saying that to people because they go, what? It's maybe a little bit of an ego thing. I don't know what it is, but I love talking about things that I'm passionate about. And if I have an enclosed group that can't leave, <laughs> <laughs> Every, all these people Everyone have been starts through, looking all these people have the been through my training sessions, so they're like, yeah, she really does kind of keep you there. For a <laughs> but, um, I'm happy to learn at, um, to develop my skills in this area and to watch everyone else develop skills. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to have Ray here helping us. So would you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? <laughs> I would say I'm an extrovert. An extrovert. You're definitely an extrovert. <laughs> Many people have the belief that you have to be an extrovert to be a good public speaker, and that's not true at all. Introverts can be very successful. Yeah. And I know speakers. extroverts who don't. So like if you're shy, problems. that's just temporary. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. We may, we may not cure that in six weeks, but <laughs> we can help you with the public speaking part. And how are you? Who are you, sir? And why are you here? Yeah, oh, uh, hello, uh, I'm Casey, as she mentioned. Uh, I'm Carrie's son. Uh, I've been volunteering with your, uh, with CNIB since, I guess, 2013, uh, when I checked. Uh, I lost track, I guess. Uh, I'm a grade 12 student at Aberdeen Hall. Uh, sort of like my mother, uh, I don't have a fear of public speaking. I wouldn't say that it's particularly enjoyable for me. Maybe that will change. <laughs> Uh, and as many people who know me would tell you, uh, much like Ray, I would sometimes get paid to shut up. Um, but uh, I am comfortable with public speaking, but I would like to improve my public speaking, especially when it comes to speaking uh, impromptu or without notes. I find it very comfortable if I'm behind a lectern, lectern speaking on a subject that I know lots about and have lots of notes about, then I'm less comfortable just speaking off the bat. So I'm hoping to improve that skill and also I'm here because I wanted to volunteer further with CNIB and be able to do more outreach. Who are this? Who are you? Hello, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Ivona Shienko, and I've been a member of Toastmaster for about two years. I joined Toastmasters because a little bit like you, um, I'm horrible with names, I'm sorry, Carrie. Okay. Carrie. Carrie. Mm -hmm. I didn't have an issue with public speaking, but I had an issue with my quality of public speaking. So I wanted to learn a little bit better um, standing in front of the people and actually um, send my message in the right way. And as, I, as you can hear, my English is my second language, so that's additional stress for me. Uh, just so you know, I am a very strong introvert. Nobody would tell knowing me a little bit, but then I go home and I have to really relax <laughs> in my own comfort <laughs> and, and quietness. How many years ago was it you and I met? 15, uh, about that? 15 years, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're both registered nurses, and at the time we both worked for Interior Health. She was lucky she got away. I'm still there. <laughs> and at the time, I was trying. To, I was still a member of the Kelowna Flying Solo Toastmasters Club. And at the time, what I was trying to do was to develop a Toastmasters Club at Kelowna General Hospital. Oh. So it was after hours, and it was for professional staff. So that's where Yvonne and I first first met. And we, we didn't get the club going. We did it for about a year, so, almost a year. And it was one of those challenges that... Professional people, when they spend their entire day at work in the hospital, they didn't want to stick around for the evening. So while we were growing and then we were back, we were shrinking, and then finally I, I eventually pulled the plug on that. But if that had worked out, who knows where that might have taken. The next thing I'm just going to give you a, an, I'll give you an overview of the agenda, what the plans are for this evening. This is very much a, a get to know you, an introduction for the program, and there is an agenda for every meeting, but. I tend to follow my agendas pretty loosely at times. It's, it's good to have structure, but I tried to... Uh, the, the secret is start at 7 into 9. <laughs> <laughs> the way I look at anything else in between is kind of details. Yeah. So we've had our introductions. I'm going to be giving an overview of the speech craft program and just maybe talk a little bit how it's a little different than, than a regular Toastmasters club. I'm going to talk about public speaking in general. Then I'm going to give uh, a speech, 
a, pre a president to speech. I don't give speeches. I hate giving speeches. I'm terrified of giving speeches. I love giving presentations, though. <laughs> and then I find the difference is that I, when I think of a speech, I think of a politician. I think of a, a, a Bible puncher minister just, you know, thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that. I hate those kind of speeches. I don't like that. But a presentation where it's interactive and you get the people involved, for me, that was a turning point. It, took my, it helped take my fear away, of public speaking. Just that simple word, taking the word speech out and taking it and making it into presentation. So I'm going to do, going to do a, an example presentation. Teresa is going to, going to do an, inter, or an evaluation of me. Then we're going to talk about the Speechcraft manuals. And then we're going to take a look at where you are right now with your speaking skills. We'll take a break. When we come back, we're going to do some table topics, which you have probably got no idea at all what table topics are. Any table topics experts here? No. <laughs> what table topics is, is impromptu speaking. You're going to speak about subjects you have absolutely no idea what those subjects are. And I'm, I'm going to, don't worry about it. No, no worry. Too early to panic yet. <laughs> <laughs> Slow the pulse down. <laughs> Hide behind the banana. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good. One. Then there's going to be an educational presentation by me on how to select a speech topic, and we're going to have a what's called a round robin evaluation. So something to think about as we go through this particular session is what you liked about it, and maybe provide some suggestions for room for improvement for the next one. Does that sound like a plan? Mm -hmm. We're going to end when we end, but certainly no later than 9 o'clock. might be earlier, but it won't be yeah. later. Great. It's already past my bedtime. <laughs> 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 okay. Overview of the program. What we have is a six, well, it's, it's a anywhere from a four to a 10 week program. The program is flexible enough that it can be used by whatever the group wants and whatever the facilitator wants to do. I go with six program or six weeks and I try to fit six people in there because I find that that's a, a group size that I can handle. I've conducted about five or six of these speech graphs basically on my own in the past. I haven't done any for eight or ten years or so. Just got busy with other things, but I've decided to uh, to revisit them. As we work through the manual, you're starting starting off with basic skills of speaking, the same as you would in a regular Toastmaster club. So this is a this is the manual, or that's actually my manual. Coordinator's manual. You're all going to be getting a copy of this, and then I understand you did get a digital version sent to you? Yeah, the people who were going to be away on Lisa received yeah. a digital version. Um, Sarah and Casey received a digital version because he was away last week, um, but Sarah will need a copy. Okay, everybody can have one. Oh, I've, got one, I've got one for everybody. I just want to make sure they also had the digital Yeah, the, yeah, the, the people who need one. Yeah, the okay. Have so, each lesson that we have from starting next week and for the following five, basically follows the same format. There's going to be a little bit of education on my part. There's going to be a table topic session, which I say you don't know anything about at all. That's where you get up and think on your feet. There'll be a session for that. And then each week you learn a new skill. So every week you're going to be preparing a three to five minute speech. Next week we'll talk about, we'll talk about it at the end of this session is what the, the homework assignment is for next week. Next week you're going to be coming and you're going to be delivering your first speech, which is called an icebreaker. And your icebreaker is not really all that much different than what you just did standing up and introducing yourself. You're going to be introducing yourself to the group and tell us something about yourself in, in three to five minutes. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Every week we have the, you'll have a speech that you'll need to do and three to five minutes Typical ones we do in a Toastmaster club are five to seven minutes speeches. They knock it down to three to five minutes because you know, we have four or five people that are participating. You want to make sure that everybody has time. 
in a typical Toastmaster Club meeting, we only usually have two, perhaps three different speeches because there's just not enough time. It's, and the, the speeches are a little bit longer. They're five to seven minute speeches. And some of them up to 20 minute speeches. My seven minute speeches tend to go 20 minutes sometimes. <laughs> not by design, just <laughs> that's just how it happens. So we'll have a bit of an educational every session. And then we'll have table topics. As we go along, you'll be introducing, I'll be introducing some more skills to you. You'll be learning how to write a speech introduction. Every speech should have an introduction. It, it sets the tone, it gets people excited about it. You'll be, as we work through, you'll be introducing each other's speeches. That's another challenging. So what we're trying to do is fit in different types of speaking. You stood up, you introduced yourself. That's one example of public speaking. You're going to be giving a speech. That's another one. You're going to be answering a table topic. That's another style of speech. Networking in the break, talking to each other, mingling. That's another style of speech. People tend to get fearful about the whole concept of public speaking. We've heard a few people here say that, well, two people said they're fearful of public speaking. You know that any time you're talking to anybody besides yourself, and that's a whole other different story, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're public speaking? You're talking to yourself. <laughs> well, that's, I happen to be a nurse, and I, I work in mental health, so I have, I, in psychiatry, so I do, have a, I do have a good understanding. And, you know, people say that, you know, if you talk to yourself, you're crazy. That's not true. People talk to themselves all the time, right? It's when you disagree with yourself. <laughs> that's, that's when it might be time for a checkup. Huh? You have an argument with yourself and you don't win. Maybe it's, time to get, maybe it's time to get things checked out. So we're going to be trying different, uh, different styles of public speaking as we go through. You're going, as we go through, we're going to show you, starting with this first meeting, how to evaluate a speech. Every speech that you do, if you've had a chance to take a look at the, the digital version, there's an evaluation that goes with every speech. With the Toastmasters program, one of the reasons that it really works and it's effective is that we provide feedback for almost every aspect of our Toastmasters program. So every time you speak, every time you stand up and do something in the Toastmasters club, you get feedback. Now a lot of people have problems with evaluation in life. Let's say you're, you're working for a living and your manager gives you a performance appraisal. Anybody ever had them? Mm -hmm. Anybody have them on fun things to do on their list? Mm -hmm. They've never been on fun things on my list to do. My managers tend to go with the carrot or the stick. I never got the taste of carrots ever. <laughs> <laughs> so when I first joined Toastmasters, I was quite terrified of, of evaluation. Many people have the idea that when you evaluate somebody, you're providing criticism. Now the word criticism, if you break it down by a definition, it tends to have a negative connotation. You're criticizing something, you're pointing out the negative or the bad things. Well, nobody wants that because, you know, that, that hurts your feelings, that's, that's just not what you want to hear. It just it turns you right off, it you know, takes you away from things. However, what we do in Toastmasters, the way we look at it is we call it constructive feedback. So what we do is we provide an evaluation that leaves you feeling good about doing something wrong if you did something wrong. That's basically how you look at it. So what we would do is we would tell you what we liked about your presentation or your speech, how it made us feel, then we would provide some room for improvement, and then perhaps we would end on a positive note. Some people call it the Oreo cookie method. I call it the sandwich method. The sandwich <laughs> method. So you got something on the outside, whether it be a piece of bread or some chocolate, chocolate wafer, so the good stuff in the middle, and then you close off with something good. So that, that's the, the cookie method of providing feedback. We do that within our Toastmasters program. I do that with parenting. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm not too sure how it works in marriage. But my, my wife's a Toastmaster. She knows if I'm doing a technique on her. <laughs> and she's also a nurse, so I can't even use effective oh, communication yeah. skills. So <laughs> I get busted every time. 
Let's see where we're at here. Any questions on the program before we move on? This is very interactive. You don't have to wait till the end to ask a question. If something comes up, not in the middle of a speech or that, but if you have a question that comes up of a process or a concept, you know, don't wait. Just just ask us, and we'll we'll go from there. So, in this particular meeting, I'm serving as a chairperson or chairman. One of the things that we do in Toastmasters to help develop your confidence and your skills is we fit something in to our speaking called a salutation. And what a salutation is, is where you recognize important people in any room. At, in Toastmasters, we would start a speech off with Mr. Chairman or Madam Chair, Madam Chair, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. If you were addressing the town council and the mayor was the most highest person in that room, it would be you know, your worship, Colin Bazarin, counselors, you go from there. So you're recognizing important people. We fit that into our, into our skill building so that if you happen to be making an official presentation, you are comfortable doing that. Now having said that, if you wanted to become a professional speaker and you wanted to go and give presentations, you're not going to fit that salutation in. It's just one of those things that we fit into our Toastmasters program, is that salutation. And some people have problems with it, because it gets, it gets stuck on your, rolling off your tongue. And the good news is, for this particular speechcraft program, I am deputizing all of you as honorary Toastmasters. <laughs> so you're not just people off the road, you're not just participants. For this session, you're going to be Toastmasters. So when you refer to each other, and you're going to be doing your introductions, you are going to be calling each other fellow Toastmasters. You want to try it once? Fellow Toastmasters. Fellow, fellow, there you fellow go. Toastmasters. Isn't that good? <laughs> I'm <laughs> Mr. Chairperson. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So temporarily. So what we're going to do, that's the first part, is I want to demonstrate delivering a Presentation, as I said, I don't give speeches, I give presentations. So typically in our Toastmaster meeting, we have a couple of people in our second half of our program that deliver speeches. Now, as I said, I'm going to be giving everyone a copy of the workbook. There's different speeches in there. As I said, they're three to five minute speeches. In our Toastmaster program, we deliver five to seven minute speeches. Basically the same idea, but our speeches are a little bit longer. And as you work through the book, each speech adds a little bit more on your skill level. So a, a new member in our Toastmaster Club, they work towards working through those ten speeches. Once they completed those ten speeches, you know, it gets a little more challenging because more skills keep getting added up. The preparation they have to do, they have to prepare the speech, they have to memorize the speech. They have to practice their delivery, and then they actually deliver it in the group, and then they get feedback from it. So it's, it's a complete process. By the time you finish 10 speeches, you're becoming a fairly proficient public speaker, a communicator. These speeches, I say, each have their own objectives. So what we're going to do for this one here is I'm going to temporarily pass the chair over to Teresa, who's going to become the chairperson. And she's got, in a moment here, not already up. She's eager. She's going, she's, she's going to be doing double duty. She's going to, I've got some explanation here to do. She's going to be introducing me as the chairperson. And then she'll, I'll shake her hand, she'll step out of the way, and I'll start delivering a presentation as I would for any other time. Now what I want you to look at or consider while my presentation is on is think about how you would evaluate me. Because while we're teaching you to speak, we also want you to think evaluation. Because that's how, that's how you learn. You learn from other people as well as yourself. You can't, you can't make all the mistakes in the world yourself, but if you learn from other people's mistakes, <laughs> your learning curve is going to go straight up. So you're going to hear a presentation from me that's going to illustrate some different things. The speech I have has some objectives for me to meet. I'm getting manual credit within my Toastmaster Club program. Teresa will then be going to give me an evaluation. 
based on how I met the objectives. Now every speech should have a, there's a basis that every speech should have. Everyone should have an opening, should grab the audience's attention. There should be something in the middle, the meat and potatoes, the body is what I call it, and then a strong conclusion. That's doesn't matter if it's a one minute speech, a 20 minute speech, or an hour long speech. The same formula. It just the longer ones, you have a little bit more meat, a little more potatoes, a little bit more to, to stretch it out. So the same ideas are there. Your speech should also fit in uh, eye contact, making contact with your audience so that you're not look like you're you know, talking over their heads or not talking. You want to engage with your audience. This is a small audience. For some people, this is, could be even more intimidating. Because let's face it, you're, you're right here. <laughs> As compared to a larger audience of several hundred people where there's so many people you can't see them anyways. Mm -hmm. You can only see the people that are in front of you. That's the only really people that... But you have to speak to the whole audience. Your hand gestures have to fit in. They have to be conducive with the topic that you're making. It can't be the opposite. You can't be holding your tongue. You know, this thing was huge. It was really monstrous. And yet your hands are right down around your knees. That, that's not appropriate. If you're talking about something that's large, you know, your hand gestures need to be expansive. They need to be, they need to be way out. They need to be consistent. As we go through, we're going to be pointing out some of those things. One of the other important things in Toastmasters is that we time everything. Now we have Yvonne who's going to be doing the timing. And we've got a low-tech solution here. I had, I had tried to work on an audio signal for us, but it, that didn't pan out for this week. So this particular speech, Yvonne is going to be timing me. And this is a, uh, a five to seven minute speech. Do you want to tell them what you're going to be doing with, uh, with these colors here? Of course. I'll give you a chance to talk. Mr. Chairperson, fellow Toastmasters, as a timer, what I will be doing is um, timing the speech and give the speaker uh, clues where he is at. So in when his speech is, I'm sorry, when his presentation <laughs> reaches five minutes, I will show the green card and I'll also say green. After six, at six minutes, I will point the yellow card and at seven minutes, I will point, show the red card, which means his time is up. With the, in our regular uh, meetings during the table topics. Yeah, we can talk about table topics later, later, just so yes. we don't confuse yeah. people. Yeah, so you're going to be saying green, yellow, and, and red. red. The same as stoplights. The idea of you're green, you're okay to go, you still got some time. Yellow, you should be speeding up to get through. Red, well, we're talking Kelowna, so red lights are optional. <laughs> <laughs> but, but red, red, it seems that way anyways. But, but with your speaking, red light means you should be slowing down and coming to a conclusion. So I was just going to ask, like, red means, like, stop completely? No, not at the time. Or like a 50-second, like, 25-second? Rule of thumb is 30 seconds. Okay. And I say it's rule of thumb because it's it's... With the table topic, we're not going to be doing it. The table topics are, are considerably shorter. Okay. And because you're doing sometimes five or six people at a time, they're very chop-chop. Right. And if, when you get to a time, you would ring a bell. That means sit down and shut up. Okay. That's the end of your time. But speeches, we don't put a final timing on. Okay. The real idea is that, depends on where you are in the program, People going through the program right now, the manual that I've talked about, our 10 manual, our 10 speech manual, going through it the first time, really should try to speak to time, five to seven minutes. So you've got till 7.30. Nothing's going to happen if you go 8 and 8.30. 8 but my first, my icebreaker speech, when I first started eventually speaking, I only had six minutes. I went 10 and a half minutes. It, it took me a long time. But you don't realize when you practice it, it goes by quickly. When you get up here, it can go by quickly or it can go by slow. It, it's time changes when you speak. It's like time tunnel or time zone change. The things, things truly change. I've competed in contests, and you've only got five to seven minute speech. And I see people, they seem to be up there forever. And they're under for seven minutes. I get up there, I'm barely getting warmed up. <laughs> I've got to sit down. So I, I don't know how things change when, it, when that happens. So what we're going to see here is a... Example of a 
of a speech presentation. Teresa is going to introduce me. I'm going to deliver the speech. And then I'm going to turn back to you. That's kind of an, an awkward thing. Because then I'll it's okay. then I'll invite you up. We'll make it work. So what am I talking about? <laughs> Oh, do you, sorry, you have no idea what you're talking oh, about? Oh, I, I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I that's, that's kind of a joke. That was it. You uh, don't know. <laughs> several, several weeks ago, we had a hole in the agenda, and I never let a hole go in, by in the agenda. And what I did was I passed a piece of paper around, and I had everybody put a topic onto uh, on a piece of paper. And I put them all in my pocket, and as I stood up, I pulled it out, what I was going to be talking about at that time. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's right. You remember that one? Yeah. That was fun. That was good. I would never, have done, never have done that one in the beginning, believe me. I was me. amazed. I okay. would never have done that one. Okay. Well, okay. <clears throat> I'll come up here to the front of the room because my voice will project a little better and it feels more natural to be here. Our speaker this evening is delivering the number four project from Toastmasters Confident Communicator Manual, which is the one that we're working from in the club. The project is how to say it. His objectives are to select the right words and sentence structure to communicate his ideas clearly, accurately, and vividly, to use rhetorical devices to enhance and emphasize ideas, to eliminate jargon and unnecessary words, and to use correct grammar. Every so often, you'll meet someone in your life that you will likely remember forever. This evening, Ray will share some stories about a memorable character in his life. Please welcome Ray Stonehouse, Distinguished Toastmasters, with Adventures with Bob. Adventures with Bob, Ray Stonehouse. As you've traveled through life, your journey through life, have you ever met a character that you know that you are going to remember for the rest of your life? Has anybody done that? Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, fellow Toastmasters, I have, and his name was Bob. Bob and I worked as registered nurses in a psychiatric hospital back in Ontario. And I spent a lot of time with Bob. We worked a 12-hour shift. And there was a lot of dead time, so he had a lot of time to get to know each other. And Bob used to be a storyteller. He would tell me a story, and every story was more incredulous than the one before them. They couldn't possibly be true, yet, apparently, every single one of the stories was true. The few minutes we have together, I want to share a few of those stories. I want to take you back in time. Some of you before your time even born, 1979. Does anybody remember 1979? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You remember disco? You remember disco? You guys remember disco? Oh, Unfortunately. Okay. Well, some people like disco. I still love the YMCA, the village people and that. Yeah, yeah. Don't know. Yeah, okay, but disco was very popular. And what, one of the things that was popular with disco, and you might remember this, was these big disco lights. Do you remember disco lights? What a disco ball was, it was about, it was a globe in the ceiling, and it was about, probably about a half a meter in diameter, and it had multiple shinier mirrors on it, it was a light. And what it did was in the discotheque, and I guess that's where disco came from, it was a style of music that played in a discotheque. They had these disco balls, and the disco balls, the dance floor was dark, disco ball would shine the light around the room, so it made a really, I guess, a exciting environment because all this light flashing around the music <laughs> pounding. Bob really was impressed. He went to a hotel and he saw this disco light. And he thought, I can do that. Now you gotta know Bob. Bob, Bob is one of these guys. He's a nurse and he's a do-it-yourselfer. He's this creative type. Wasn't always great on the follow-through as we're going to see. He could create anything. He went home and he thought, you know, I can do that. So what he did was he went to his local Zeller store in our town, and he purchased about 30 tumblers or glasses. We have a glass right here. This would be a, a medium-sized one. He ordered some small ones, 
and he ordered some medium-sized ones, and he ordered some large ones. He had this idea that as you walked in through his front entrance to his house, you should be greeted by a disco light. <laughs> not, a, not necessarily any disco light. This is a disco light that he created. Now, I don't know if you're any everybody's familiar with this style of home, but just, just vision what this would look like. You walk in the front door and you're on a small landing. Now you have two choices. You can either go upstairs to the living room and the kitchen area, or you can go downstairs to a basement area. But you can't go anywhere if you stay there on that landing. And if you look straight up in the air, it's a cathedral ceiling. And on the top of that cathedral ceiling, in most houses that are of this style, there was a, a chandelier. And it was often construction grade. It was a very cheap chandelier. Bob got this idea that if he replaced this cheap chandelier with a disco light, it would be awesome. <laughs> it, would, it would be just fantastic. He sets out to work one day when his wife is at work. Her name was Margaret. Margaret's also a nurse. And she was at work that day. He did this all in one day. He got a piece of plywood, probably about almost three foot in diameter. He cut a complete circle around, so a circle of the jigsaw, he had a circle of plywood, a huge piece of plywood like this. He got up into the attic, and I don't know where he got it, but he had purchased somewhere, used or to wreck her, a quarter horsepower electric motor. And he got up in the roof, I don't know if anybody's ever been in the roof before, but there's joists up there, mm -hmm. and there's often electric. He took out the chandelier and he mounted this electric motor on top of, on the, on top of the ceiling, up where the joists were. He put a metal shaft down, a good four feet, hooked it into the motor, and he hooked in this wooden plywood circle. Now on the circle, he mounted all of these plastic tumblers, 30 tumblers, clear, what he did was he drilled a hole in each of them and screwed them onto the plywood. So what you have is a piece of plywood, a circle of plywood, with 30 cups mounted underneath and a light bulb shining on it. Great. The idea was that the idea was that the light would shine through the tumblers and it would, as it moved, it would give this light spinning around the room, really setting the ambience of as you walked in the front room. Bob got it all set up. Everything was, was wired up. He hadn't had a chance to test it out, though. He wanted to turn it on right when his wife came home from work, Margaret. Because he really wanted to impress her. That's what was in his mind. That's what the plan was. In reality, what happened was, Margaret opened the front door. Bob flicked the switch to impress Margaret. Then all of a sudden, Pardon my language, all hell broke loose. I can't think of any other way to say it. When he hit that switch, the light started spinning around and it was like a war zone. Hand grenades were going off, flying against the wall, smashing against the ceiling, smashing against the floor. There was plastic shrapnel everywhere. Margaret thought she was under attack. She dove for the floor screaming. She thought she was going to die. Now I said... Bob was, Bob was a nurse. He wasn't an engineer. What he hadn't thought of was that there could be some electrical problems. Is there any, any electrical engineers there? <laughs> anyway, a quarter horsepower motor puts out some 2,500 RPMs, revolutions per minute. <laughs> he hadn't thought that perhaps he should be reducing the speed down. So what happens, when he clicked it, these things shot off like missiles and almost killed Margaret. So that was the end of the disco light. Margaret made him put back the cheap chandelier. Now that was one example of a story that Bob told. So I want to tell another one quickly to give you an idea what it was like working with Bob. Bob was a guy that came up with the ideas. Didn't always plan things out. He got this idea. He commuted to work every day. It was about a 30 mile drive to work. And somebody would have to drive into the neighborhood off of the highway to pick him up. So he gets the idea that if he could find a shortcut to the road, the highway, which was just behind his house, he could save five minutes off that person's drive. They wouldn't have to do it. So like anybody else, 
what would be the most common thing you could think of doing? He digs a tunnel in his backyard, a good 500 feet up to the highway, so the tunnel started off in his backyard. He could just go out the backyard, go into the tunnel, and be standing on the highway where the person could pick him up. That's what the plan was. And Bob toiled all summer long digging this tunnel. Now we're not talking a small tunnel. We're talking a tunnel that was eight foot high, eight foot round, and just went into the ground. He said that the tunnel was so large that it went underneath the roots of a large oak tree. And he was saying that, you know, on a hot day, Ontario is really hot, it's humid. You could sit underneath the roots of that oak tree and it would be a good 10 to 12 degrees cooler than everywhere else. It was fantastic. <laughs> we kidded him about being, you know, the seven dwarfs. Remember that in the snowy? Hi ho, hi ho, <laughs> you know, little miners. That's what he would do. He'd get home from work. So he spent his entire summer digging this mine shaft so that he could save five minutes on his commute. Well, Bob wasn't a planner. We, we know that he wasn't an electrical engineer. He certainly wasn't, he wasn't a miner either. Because what he had never thought of was that perhaps if you've got a hole that's this big, you should shore it up. When the rains of November came and poured down, it collapsed everything. The oak tree toppled over, almost hit his house. Everything collapsed. Fortunately, he wasn't in there. This was the way... Bob was. And every story that he told me, it couldn't possibly be true. You know, if I had a lot more time, I'd tell you about how he renovated his basement to look like uh, the haunted house in, in uh, Disneyland. Or the time he cut his, thumb, his finger off on the table saw and taped it back on. Yeah, I didn't believe that one either till I saw the, till I saw the, saw the, saw the scar. But that was, that was Bob. Lots more stories. Maybe another time I'll share them with you. Thanks, Lassie. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt while I was listening. Uh, okay. I want to be Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're still alive. Oh, <laughs> I wonder if Bob knows you're talking about him. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ray, for your speech tonight. I'm going to evaluate Ray's speech, and this speech was specifically, as we said before, how you say it. So lots of use of um, good vocal variety and things like that. And I like how Ray opened his speech. He opened it with a question to the audience, which is a really good way to engage people and some technique that you might find useful in the future as well. It's, uh, it's just a little quick tri uh, trick to uh, connect with your audience before you begin your speech. Definitely was use of a rhetorical question. You weren't really supposed to answer, although I think I did. <laughs> the story was interesting, and you wonder where it's going, because it starts out with this guy and, you know, this whole description and where, how he sees this disco ball and he's going to build it. And I really think Ray did an excellent job of describing the everything. that You could see the disco ball, or well, what was supposed to be the disco ball, and you could see Bob, and you, you could sort of imagine all of this, even though these were stories that were told to Ray, and he's reliving them here, but I think he did a really good job. And it was also... Um, you could see that he was also engaging his audience with really good use of hand gestures. And that's another way to sort of convey your message as well to the audience. And it also helps to emphasize a point that you might be trying to make. One gift on the hand gestures, though, I did find occasionally, it's hard to show, but occasionally Ray would, would kind of use two hands together. Mm -hmm. And I think that just might be something, it's a habit. We all have habits and they're really tough to break. So the evaluations are good because you come up and you mention that and it's something that next time he does a speech, he's probably going to watch for that. And I also enjoyed the ending of Ray's speech because he kind of left us hanging a little bit and there was so much more we wanted to know about Bob so he gave ideas about oh yeah he told me about this and then he told me about this 
we're thinking, well, I want to know more about Bob. You know, what, what did he do about that? So I think he did a very good job of uh, conveying a very simple message to us about a gentleman he once knew. And I felt like I kind of wanted to meet Bob as well, yeah. just like you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. So what you have is an example of a, giving a presentation with a, an opening body and a conclusion. And then Teresa provided some feedback and evaluation. I hear the gestures quite often over the years. I do struggle with, with the gestures. Gestures is where is the hand placements, where you fit your hand placements. When I first started in Toastmasters and started speaking, I had some problems coming up with my own style of speaking. And I tried to emulate other speakers in the club that I thought were better speakers than I were. But eventually I had a, a Toastmaster who said to me, Ray, don't try to copy somebody else. Create your own style. So I found that my style, like I say, I don't like giving speeches, but I like having dialogue with a group of people. I like my style has become entertaining. I enjoy doing that. I have fun. If I have a club or a, uh, an audience that's really interactive and, and laughing and, or even booing, you know, I don't have a problem with that at all. At least I know they're alive and they're participating. <laughs> you know, I, I enjoy that. The audience that just sits there stone-faced and, and doesn't get anything out of it, I, you know, I have challenges with that. When I first started speaking, or sort of just to backtrack, Teresa was talking about my hand gestures tend to be in here. What I learned is that okay, right now I'm speaking at about 125 words a minute. Most of us speak at around 125 words a minute. If you're speaking really fast, you can get it up to around 150 words a minute. Well, we think in terms of 1,000 to a couple thousand words per minute. You know that expression, a picture's worth a thousand words? Well our minds are divided while we're thinking about our presentation, how fast we're, we're speaking, we also have what's going on in the rest of our world. Now if you just think about what else is happening in this room. You're listening to me speak, but you can also hear a heating system in the background somewhere. Yeah. You're also sitting on a chair, you might be thinking my butt's getting kind of sore. You're feeling pressure in different parts of your body. Maybe, maybe you need to go to the bathroom. Those are things in your mind. You have all control of those, but a lot of those are in the background. So when you start speaking in public or before a group, the secret is, is to master all those things. So while you're delivering your presentation that you have a good understanding of, at the same time, at the thousand a word minute, level, you're also thinking, okay, this person over here is starting to fall asleep. I need to pick it up a little bit. This person, they're really paying attention to me over there. Boy, is it ever hot in this room here. Am I going too fast? What's that time there? What? I'm at a red flag already. I'm just picking up speed. I'm just starting. So you're thinking of all these different things. And that the more you speak, you get to be able to master all of those different uh, things going on at once. And that's really where the skill develops, is that you can control everything. And while you're doing that, you're not worrying about fear. One of the things that I, challenges I had in the beginning was my stance. Now, people used to tell me that I used to have called a gunslinger pose for my presentations. <laughs> Feet apart, hands at the side, I was ready to shoot anybody. <laughs> well, that, they had to tell me my feedback was to loosen up a little bit. Then I think I was, I was standing with, <clears throat> with one leg to the front, one leg to the back, off to the side. Now, this may you may not see anything out of the ordinary with this. However, in my field of nursing, in psychiatry and mental health, where we are trained in self-defense, uh -huh. when I'm going up to a, dis you're, you're doing my psych patient, when I'm walking up to a, a disturbed individual of this potential, <laughs> I'm going to stand to the side like this, yeah. so that, you know, I'm ready to defend myself, I'm ready to move out of the way. Oh. Well, speaking before a group, Odds are, nobody's going to come up and kick you. <laughs> nobody's going to come up and punch you. <laughs> it's a pretty safe, it might be scary, but it's a pretty safe environment. So I had to learn to come up with a new style of a place to stand. And the hand gestures have always caused me a problem. They're a little bit easier when I take my jackets off. My jackets, sometimes, the, the sleeves tend to be restrictive. 
So that, that caused me some problems. So working in your hand gestures. One of the other things that when I first started off, the people commented to me was my style or my rate of speaking. When we're talking about speaking, we're talking about volume. We're talking about the rate, so that's how many words you would fit into a minute. The pitch, the pitch would be talking a little bit higher. When I started, when I first speaking, my wife told me that when I, when I got excited, I started to talk like Donald Duck. My, my voice would get really higher. <laughs> I had to learn to be able to speak quicker, clearer, but still within my normal voice range. So to build up excitement, build up enthusiasm without sounding like Donald Duck. So that was a challenge that I had. Now most people, and they encourage you to do that, is that when you create a speech, is to write it out. Now what they don't encourage you to do is to memorize a speech. Anybody heard that one before? Any, any idea why you wouldn't do that? That's all I've been told to do. <laughs> no. no, you don't want to memorize your speech. Any idea why? Forget. Yeah, exactly, ex yeah. exactly. Because if you memorize it word for word and something happens in your environment that wasn't in your practice, you could easily forget where you are. No, I think I may be only on two occasions of speeches I've ever forgotten where I was at. And it's usually because I tried factoring something in. No, I say I wished I had have written down my speeches. I've given hundreds and hundreds of speeches. I do them in my head. But I don't memorize them. What I do is I create a road map. I start off with something. Like I have an idea of a concept. This is what I'm going to talk about. I have an opening. I want to grab people's attention. I give them some examples of it, tell some story, then I come up with a conclusion. So that's the road map of what I do. And then I fit it in. So when I, when I practice my speech, I'm not memorizing it, but I think about it in chunks. Here's my opening. I know that opening in and out. So while it's memorized, in that sense, it's not like memory work. Remember we used to have to do memory work back in school, in high school? Mm -hmm. Memorize poems? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hated doing those things. I can remember grade 11 English said do something about tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow. Remember that one? Does that sound familiar at all from Shakespeare? I got like one for a mark. All I got was the first sentence, tomorrow, tomorrow, and I think I spelled tomorrow wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I got one mark and the whole memory works. So, so I hate memory. Sorry to... Um, it's all fine. Pardon me to cut you off. Um, how... Somebody has to. <laughs> <laughs> because I know last week Carrie was talking about how there's kind of like the mission state, like there's certain things that yeah. we have to have when we're delivering our presentation, so... We can honestly, like, we'll work on that after you've been through all of this. Okay. That's just to give you an idea that at the end, we're okay. going to have this little package, but again, like you said, it's not writing it down, it's just, um, here's some general ideas of things that we'd really love for you okay. to hit on. And beginning with an intro, moving through your own story, and I think once you're through with the sessions with Ray, you'll feel really comfortable with this, but we will have a wrap-up session where we can actually go through your own story. Yeah. And there may be time at some point with Ray when you're creating your own speeches with him. One of the techniques I've heard for professional speakers is while they might be creating a, an awesome keynote, they also create like almost 100% more content than what's actually in the presentation. What happens is if you memorize your speech, you're following, you're following it linearly, linearly, mm -hmm. like you're reading a story, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens if you forget something? Right. Yeah. Will, will it matter to anybody? Most people don't know what your presentation's about. So if you forget something, unless it's a key point that you want to make, Nobody's going to know it besides you. So I, I, I learn, my style is I learn in chunks. So each one is a chunk. So in, in this particular story with Bob, the first chunk was leading up to the introduction. It was a rhetorical question. That was a chunk. The second chunk was introducing Bob where I worked with him. The, second, the third chunk was Bob or disco, setting up the disco scene. The next was getting into Bob's house. So these are all series of, of chunks. Now, to be truthful, I've given this speech several times. I've given it uh, 
different versions of it. I've given longer versions of it. I think I've actually written the story down, so I'm familiar, familiar with the story. So it's not the first time that I used it. But there's enough material there that if the opportunity came, I could, I could pop right into those other stories and I could give uh, different aspects of the ones that I didn't tell. So what you're going to, you're going to have all kinds of content with the, you know, what you're going to be doing for CNIB mm -hmm. so that if a question comes up this way, you can take it in that direction. You will have it there. It doesn't mean you're going to deliver every single word that you know. You've got twice as much content so that if it comes up, you'll never be stumped. Take a break? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, a little bit over. Yeah, we're fairly flexible with these. Okay, let's just take a. I haven't got a clock. Quarter to. Hmm? It's quarter to. Okay, let's take a break till, till 8 o'clock. Then we're going to come back and then we're going to do uh, the exercise of where we're at in, the, in our speaking and then we're going to do some table topics and, you yeah. know. Okay, yeah. any questions so far? Oh, nice. Oh, that's can nice. Yourself. Thank you. To wake up? Okay. And snacks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. Thank you. Would you like anything, Lisa? Oh, okay. yeah, I think I'll have a coffee. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yes, I just um, I just want to add to what Ray was saying. And I think mm -hmm. that it's what what he he is also saying is that I know we as you learn public speaking, you're going to learn certain tools from Ray, but then you're going to develop your own style. Mm -hmm. 